Hi, good afternoon, um, and, and welcome to It Makes Us Think of a Dance and a Fate as much, of, as, much as of War on Violence. Um, my name is Woodrow Kernahan, and I'm the director of EVA International, Biennial of Contemporary Art in Limerick City. Um, this is the third and final symposium in the series, Artistic Justice, Positions on the Place of Justice in Art, that has taken place in Limerick, Marrakesh, and now Dublin, in the lead-up to the 36th edition of EVA International, that opens in three weeks. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on a, on a changeable Saturday. Um, the curator of this year's EVA International, Bassam El Baroni, has invited Doreen Mende to curate this symposium, and it is... And it is and it is presented in partnership with IMA, Irish Museum of Modern Art. Doreen Mende works internationally as an exhibition maker, curator, writer, and theorist based in Berlin. Her latest projects are the itinerant when ex exhibiting turns its back against itself in the frame of the online residency of Manifesto Journal and the research exhibition Double, Bond, Double Bound Economies, departing from a photo image archive of the real existing socialism in the GDR. She co-founded the research group Travelling Communique on the foundational moment around 1961 of the non-aligned movement. Currently, she's preparing an exhibition on capitalist realism with works by K.P. Bremer for Raven Row in, in, in London. She is co-founder of the publication series Displayer and faculty member of the Dutch Institute, Dutch Art Institute, D DAI. She holds a PhD in curatorial knowledge um, from Goldsmiths. Uh, this symposium series has been made possible through the generous support of the Anna Lind Foundation and Eva, Interla Eva International would like to thank the Anna Lind Foundation for this support as well as the Arts Council, Limerick City and County Council and Limerick City Gallery of Art for their ongoing support. I would like to say a specific thank you to Noel Collins, Sally Ann McFadden, Adrian Kelleher, Sophie Byrne, Catherine O'Byrne, and Anne Luttrell for their help towards developing this symposium. And thank you to Avcom and the Wright Catering Company for looking after us. Um, Deirdre Power um, is uh, taking photographs of today's event on behalf of EVA International, and we would be planning to share those online on, and on our social media. So if anyone would prefer us not to share photographs with them from today's event, please let us know. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all our speakers who have travelled specifically for today's symposium, and would like to invite Doreen Mende to say a few words to introduce today's symposium. Thanks and enjoy the day. Yes, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much indeed, Woodrow, for this very kind introduction. And also, I would like to thank, uh, heartful thanks to Bassam El Baroni for inviting me today to conceive that uh, one day public reflection on the paradoxical relations to violence. It's a very complex, very tricky, very challenging and confronting topic that I have been working on with quite a group of people over the last years in various formats, in form of a reading group, in projects, in uh, own kind of traveling encounters and so on. And I'm very honored to be here today. And I think the framework that Basam has been building with that biennial is absolutely important and crucial. And uh, he had invited me uh, for doing this uh, seminar today, or the conference, in a series of seminars under the title Positions on the Place of Justice in Art, that are going to lead towards the biennial's opening in a few couple of days or two, three weeks. And I think this proposal to consider justice in art is absolutely challenging and really um, demanding because uh, it leaves behind to some extent the exhausted and problematic genre of political art that we have been discussing throughout the last decades so much in favor for introducing the juridical figure in artistic practice. Who are we that we claim a position on the place of justice and to do justice to whom? who legitimizes our position, our images and speeches in front of the law. 
I think the call for the political within artistic, is it good with the microphone actually? Can, is it a nice sound or is it too loud or too? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the political, I mean, I don't want to be misunderstood, is uh, uh, the political within artistic pr uh, production is still necessary, but uh, we enter a further strand within that call if we open up our view on politics by reflecting on the law, that means on the juridical structures of knowledge, power, and representation in relation to art. And I just would like to remind the performance yesterday that Nasto um, Mosquito was doing, that he has been addressing all that issues, and also Basam yesterday in his introduction to the biennial, it's just exactly on the question of the kind of juridical structures, but all the power structures in relation to knowledge and artistic production. In other words, the concern for justice, which inevitably also calls for its counterpart, injustice, introduces a juridical dimension in the field of contemporary art. And we have to keep in mind contemporary art must be discussed today always in resonance with working conditions and within conditions for distribution and presentation in a globalizing world. There is no excuse for us anymore, we, who have access to data and capital. This is one way how globalization had been defined by Garantia Spivak. Not, it, there's no excuse for us anymore today not to be aware of the heterogeneity of cultures, the different forms of knowledge, of the various roles of art in social or economic situations. To be here in Dublin today feels just the most appropriate environment and also this space I think is just perfect for our today's conversation, to continue the search for vocabulary or the means of articulation, how we can talk about violence if we agree that violence is not simply an event over there, that we may follow via internet, news reports, statistics, or expert analysis, or artistic projects, but violence is a permanent condition that connects us as much as separates us from one another on global scale. Before I'm going to point to a few concerns and questions that have been driving the conception and the framework for that um, conference today, I would like to introduce uh, the schedule and the speakers um, for the day. I'm really grateful and happy that um, the invitations uh, arrived and to open ears. Um, I start in the order of um, the contributions today. So very important interlocutor was Jean-Luc Godard. He's still alive, so he's still an interlocutor. <laughs> and we are going to uh, see a film by him of the origin of the 21st century as a kind of one proposal to understand how we can how can we complicate a discussion on conflicts and social struggles in relation to uh, the, the trains and the limits of history. So uh, another really important interlocutor had been Jean Genet and I'm very grateful that Adrien Laroche is going to introduce us in the work by Jean Genet. I'm going to introduce all the contributors uh, more in detail when it comes to their presentations. I just would like to sketch out a little bit the day. And uh, you see here Jean Genet together with Angela Davis and um, Adrienne is going to talk about uh, quite a bit in uh, terms of uh, the notion of violence that Jean Genet complicated by introducing a kind of um, the conflict of violence with brutality, brutality of the state, brutality of institutions and structures, and how violence could be even conceived as an emancipating uh, means. And this is, poses a lot of questions. Then uh, the second contributor of the day is Yasmin Eitzabak, and I'm very happy that Yasmin came from Spain um, yesterday. And uh, I met Yasmin Edzabak in Beirut when I had been uh, living there for a few months for a residency and we had a continuous exchange of thoughts and discussions about the question of responsibility to expose and to exhibit images than one was entrusted with by someone else, particularly in the condition of, or in the kind of the framework of the Palestinian question and the question also of image production that comes with that concern. 
So this is the image that Yasmin had provided, and I'm sure she is going to talk about that <laughs> in her contribution. I cannot explain it, just to have uh, the introduction also on screen. Uh, after Yasmin's present, we are going to have a break, the lunch break, and uh, after lunch break at three. I'm very grateful that uh, Paolo Tavares joins us today in Dublin, and uh, he extended his stay in Europe for another week to be here today with us. And this is really very much appreciated because Paolo is working on quite a lot of projects, including a PhD, and everyone knows uh, that this uh, demands all focus. And I'm really grateful that Paolo comes here today and is going to talk about um, um, archaeology of violence. In terms of, I mean, this is what we have been discussing at the Dutch Art Institute, and we'll talk about this later uh, a little bit. Um, how, how can we understand violence not only in the formula that is exposed to us every day, kind of on television, of injured bodies, of people being beaten up, of war zones, of a weapon that we see and we would immediately connect with violence. Paolo's talk will focus on the inscription of violence into landscape and the role of architecture as an archaeological kind of um, approach to understand how violence mechanisms operate towards landscape, particularly in the condition of uh, the contemporary Brazilian society. So I think this is um, another phase. Then uh, there is a change in the program. Milica Tomic, she is an artist based in Belgrade. She could not come today because her visa was not granted. <laughs> and this is, a, this is violence, I think, very much indeed. <laughs> so uh, we have been now, uh, and she had been very busy, uh, we really tried everything now to uh, have a few films that she down, um, uploaded and she's going to talk on uh, via Skype. But it's uh, really kind of a shame because to talk about violence requests the presence of the body. And this is also one crucial aspect of this day today that we here uh, commit ourselves with our bodies and our minds to <laughs> this complicated issue. However, Melissa Tomic, she remains like uh, to be a lecture presentation on Turbo Folk, and I'm going to introduce it later. And then I'm very happy uh, to continue a collaboration with Mercedes Aspilicueta. And we have been working together at the Dutch Art Institute, where I had been teaching theory for three years, and Mercedes, she was a participant of the program, and we run a reading group over one year on various concepts, proposals regarding violence. How can we complicate our vocabulary and our understanding? And I ask Mercedes to conceive um, um, a, a, a poetry speech performance. Mercedes is working with um, speech, with sound, with uh, uh, the sound of the voice. And uh, she has been uh, reflecting uh, the resonances of this one-year reading group, but also it connects very much to a project she is doing at the very moment. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. So these are the presentations, and this is like one part. Another really important part of the day is the final discussion, and we are going to see how the schedule is taking us. So stay with us. And I'm really grateful uh, that Denise Ferreira da Silva came to Dublin also today. Um, uh, I got to know Denise Ferreira da Silva through uh, the poet and theorist Fred Moten, uh, who introduced me to um, her work uh, that uh, is absolutely crucial in the discussion of violence through uh, raciality and the law. And I think uh, this is crucial to have Denise Ferreira today here as a respondent to the presentations, also to shift the case studies that we are going to listen over the day onto a, a wider kind of framework to begin to develop the vocabulary. And Denise is uh, giving a response to the presentations also as an opening up for uh, a discussion and conversation with the audience. And uh, so, I mean, also, Denise, uh, what we are going to do in the final discussion is like the juridical figure uh, with regard to images, speeches, and so on, uh, in relation to uh, how that could connect to art, architecture, poetry, image, and so on. So, I mean, how this goes together. It's, it's really a complicated question. 
So sorry. Um, I have to see the time. Can I make? Uh, where is Noel? Aha. So maybe I just uh, read a few words before we are going to um, begin with the presentations. Allow me to propose a few thoughts. Uh, it's a very small thing. It looks very large scale, but this is really small. And one, I will move this a bit like this. Okay, <laughs> and maybe this a bit. Okay, it will be fine. I hope it won't fall. Allow me to propose a few thoughts that will help to open, that hopefully will help to open today's discussion on the question of violence and within that, our position in the place of justice. In one of the sessions of our reading group at the Dutch Art Institute, we read Franz Fanon, a psychiatrist and revolutionary of liberation movements of the Algerian society uh, from the French colonial rule during the 1950s and 1960s. And we consider Franz Fanon as one of the most important and crucial voices in the analysis of the mechanisms of violence, both as a disciplining instrument through colonialism and the colonial rule, and as a revolutionary means. Violence, in his consideration, first, is not simply an event that could be measured in a linear time with a beginning and an end, or that could be easily located. Instead, Fanon considers violence as a psychoaffective motivation that emerges from the people's experience of extreme violence or brutality, as Jean Genet would say. And this extreme violence operates on a visible scale through institutions like the prison, the hospital, the army, the school as much as on an invisible scale, and that I think is even more important, that executes the law without being able to take any form of responsibility for one's own actions. I bring in a very banal example. Uh, the policy of EasyJet is like a way how violence operates invisibly. We, uh, <laughs> we all have gone through uh, this if light had been cancelled. But there is not a single person we could talk to to figure out how we could continue our journey. And um, there is no one that would take the responsibility to kind of figure out what to do. And this is not a question of service, but it's just simply a question of taking position as responsibility. So violence is the ultimate consequence of a process between deeply conflicting wills and parties, between the execution of the law through the state, state institutions, and a resisting body that rejects to be governed by the law. And this is a conflict. One also could say even more radically that the law, after all, needs and depends on bodies outside of the law. In other words, law only can be recognized as law if it produces a space in which a body remains excluded from any form of political public appearance in its own right. It, this is an exclusion from society legitimized by the law, and this is something Denise Ferreira da Silva has been working on a lot in an excellent uh, essay uh, where she uh, introduced the term, uh, the figure of the nobodies, those who are excluded by the law from political and public representation. So in return, and this is the moment when violence becomes more complicated, and this is also one major aspect of this conference, violence has an integrative power. In fact, we have seen such potency uncannily articulated during the London riots a few years ago when students, British diasporic black communities and low-class citizens went on the streets, burning cars, looting shops and attacking the state's executive organ, the police. We could go so far even to argue that the London riots have revealed the consequences of social injustice, which is a form of structural violence legitimized by the law, in terms of education, the increasing of, oh, sorry, of tuition fees, this was Militza, I guess, uh, and uh, at British universities and also racial discrimination. To go on the street and to use militant forces, so to speak, places the permanent condition of violence, that means its structural mechanisms, on display. 
on our computer screens or perhaps also in front of our windows, on television and in public debates. And this is nothing else than a proof, first, that violence operates through various stages from state power towards society and vice versa. And second, that violence reintegrates, it's actually something Fanon has uh, analyzed, violence reintegrates those who are excluded from access to education, equality, property, accumulation of wealth, social property, cultures of remembrance, and so on. So this is a way to, I mean, to self-empower yourself to be reintegrated in the mechanisms of society and the infrastructures of society. So now I can hear already voices in the audience, <laughs> I hope so, that would absolutely argue against such an approach to violence and absolutely insist in the concepts of non-violence. Well, I have to tell you that a clear cut, which would divide the world in two, good, bad, justice, injustice, violence, non-violence, is not only an unrealistic proposal, but also reproduces the age of extremes of the 20th century. And this is Eric Hobsbawm defined this as a binary constellation between great power and counterpower, capitalism and realism, west, east, north, south, which all come with highly competing concepts playing out justice against injustice according to the dominating voice within a binary principle. So we all, I think, remember the conditions of the Cold War of the 20th century. But in a world of the financial crisis, global conflict such as Syria, when China invests massively in African countries' migration politics, refugees of civil wars, increasingly heterogeneous societies, and in a time when the mayor of Lampedusa, Giuseppe Nicolini, vehemently requests to rethink migrating politics in Europe, such binary constellations reveal their absolute limits and also reveal the necessity to open up a space in between the categories good, bad, justice, injustice, violence, non-violence. A second thought that also I think is important, or it's important for this conference, a second thought that I would like to address, or I would like to ask, what after all, and by all means, have these issues to do with art, with images? words. Over the last years I have been working a lot with various institutions as well as independent artists, scholars and students in the Middle East, particularly in the dispersed geographies of Palestine, and from my practice I learned to understand that any local conflict always is absolutely entangled with global and geopolitical networks. It becomes apparent in funding policies in the world of art, in economic disbalances and residency programs reasoned by citizenship, and access to resources, education, visa regulations, and so on. These working conditions in the realm of art profoundly shape any mode of production and massively decide over the visibility of an artist in the international scene. These aspects, which become an everyday situation, and the work of international curators and artists has made me reflecting on the consequences of that, what we do as exhibition makers when we travel around the world and conceiving exhibitions, screening programs, conferences, and so on. That shall translate a particular situation from elsewhere into a present location here, as Dublin, for example. My practice made me understand that any event of exhibiting, that means exposing images, speeches, defining histories in public after they travel with me from one place on the globe to another one, is always also a practice of displacement. So when you take an image or an artistic project from one place to the other, you always displace images. You displace a practice, you display words, displace words, and so on. And this is the moment when the forces of violence inexorably determine all our actions as exhibition makers, artists, filmmakers, theorists, and so on, everyone who exposes images, sounds, and words in public. Because, and here let me come to the title of the symposium, it makes us think of a dance and a fet as much as of war, in brackets, on violence, which is a sentence borrowed from Jacques Derrida, suggests us to think about violence as following. There was, in fact, the first violence to be named, to give a name, 
to learn a language of the world of art, of politics, of medicine, economics, trade, court. We all learn a particular language all the time. We have to. And that also simply requests to subscribe to the laws of its particular language without any compromise. Also to take an image, to show an image, simply requests our absolute complicity with the ideology of the visual, like technology, materiality, econo economics, resources, means of production, and so on. A second violence is at stake with the protection of naming, to give names in alliance with a set of image-forming faculties. This request comes with a double face because to have a name enables to be exposed in public, which is a political concern. To have a name facilitates to have a public presence and also to be recognized by a curator, by the market, by mass media, and so on. In consequence, this kind of protection suggests to do justice towards those who had been named, but it is nothing else than to introduce a classification to introduce um, kind of uh, a structuring device to be able to differentiate and to separate between different bodies. And this, and this is Derrida actually says, he would say this supports a battle of names and here we are under con condition of, of, of war. And the third violence emerges with the arrival of the foreigner, the spectator, or Fred Moten would say, the external world when a stranger appears, who cannot do differently than to enter this battle of naming, of visibility, of a public debate. The naming and the protection of naming, it's a reproduction, always conceals the excess of not yet outspoken, unknown, forgotten, subjugated, unimaginable, repressed, hidden names. And this is a problem. Who is the foreigner then? I am certainly a foreigner myself today in Dublin, but are we here all foreigners in a museum of modern art who produce a space and a public debate on account of those whose names are concealed by those who speak and who give a name? And that violence is possible only at the moment when the space is shaped and reoriented by the glance of the foreigner. The eye or the ear of the others calls out the name, spells it out, and removes any possibility for a life before the law, before, and this is a temporal before the law, before the law is constituted, before the government is in operation, and before any classifying faculties. And this space sounds very familiar to us because it is the space to make names, images, histories public, the exhibition space, the museum. So, shall we continue to make exhibitions then? Of course. <laughs> it's not only a rhetoric question, it's a serious question. Of course we have to continue to make exhibitions, because it is our duty, uh, in terms of a political responsibility, to make thoughts and things public, as it is the right for everyone to make thoughts and things public, that means to speak in one's own name. So you see the dilemma. The major questions for today are, what if violence just disturbs securing concepts of either or, good, bad, justice, injustice, violence, non-violence? What if it throws us in a terrible conflict because what we thought was non-violent would have turned out to be violent? And can we as artists, filmmakers and theorists produce a space in which our languages, sounds, images are able to sabotage the principles of the law in order to undo its classifying forces? Is undoing violence that which we want after all? So these are a few... Um, thoughts, proposals whatsoever that have been shaping um, the conference and it's, the conference is also kind of a result of conversation with many people, the contributors of today, but also, I mean, it's a continuous process. And this is the end of the introduction and I would like to also not forget, um, yeah, I think maybe I... No, I did not really do it properly. To thank Woodrow Can uh, Canoha, Noel Collins, Bassam El Baroni for enabling this um, day, the Muse Irish Museum of Modern Art, to host that event. 
And I also would like to thank the contributors to come over to share their ideas, thoughts, and proposals. And I also would like to thank you, the audience, that you commit yourself to spend a day here in the museum to discuss and to uh, expose yourself to such a demanding, uh, very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay, I would like to introduce the first contribution. Ah, the first contribution is uh, Jean-Luc Godard. I was looking at Adrienne and no, 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 sorry. So, I mean, I think uh, Jean-Luc Godard is, uh, I don't have to introduce him, uh, the origin of the 21st century. It is a film that he had been commissioned by the uh, festival, uh, the film festival in Cannes. They were asking for a film to celebrate the change of the millennium in 2000. And uh, very typical for Godard, would say, well, sorry, I cannot do a film that would celebrate the millennium change. Uh, and he produced an essay film uh, the origin of the origin of the 21st century that um, kind of uh, reveals um, what he says. I tried to cover up the memories of terrible explosions and crimes through children's faces and the tears and smiles of women. And uh, maybe I just start the film and um, it might open up the space of images of speeches but also the conference today. <laughs> <laughs> 